From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Jason Prell. Jason I Prell. manage Mrs. Cronin's trust fund. Oh, sure. We haven't met, of course, and I know that I'm overstepping the ordinary bounds of propriety, but I simply have to talk to you immediately, if possible. Well, can't it wait until train time? You're going with us up to a party in the Adirondacks, aren't you? Yes, I am, but it'll be too late then to make very much difference. Well, uh, maybe you could tell me the general idea of what you want. I understand Mrs. Cronin has authorized you to obtain the circle of fire from the bank and to keep it in your possession until she wears it at the party. Yeah, that's right. Don't do it. Leave the necklace where it is. Why? It's a long story, Mr. Dollar, and it goes a long way back. The whole thing is a lot more complicated than you realize. Well, I'm beginning to realize it. Just exactly what is it you're worried about? I'm worried about Mrs. Cronin's sanity. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. Expense account continued. Item four, a dollar and eighty cents. Taxi to the offices of the Daily Times Courier for a look at the morgue files on Mrs. Cronin. The clipping started with the year 1916, when a bright-eyed, wide-eyed kid named Dolly McLean danced her way out of the chorus lines of a two-bit musical and straight into the limelight of Broadway. One hit show after another. Hits just because she was in them. And parties, balls, social affairs. The dancing darling. A critic tagged it with a name in her first write-up, and the name stuck. So she danced. Danced away the mad, crazy years that followed World War I. And like everybody else, she lived it up. There were rumors of engagements, love affairs, the Baron this, count that, one after another. Shorty Weber was mentioned a few times. And Jason Prell was in from the beginning as a promoter, though, a business manager, not as a lover. Her friends were mentioned, hundreds of them. Then Barnaby Cronin came into the file. Boy wonder of the business world, the golden prince. Engagement, marriage, and Barnaby's fabulous gift to his new bride, a half-million-dollar necklace of diamonds and emeralds, the circle of fire. Then Barnaby's sudden death, Mrs. Cronin's seclusion. End of file. Expense account item five, $24.30, transportation, hotel, and incidentals. And a taxi to the railway station to find the special coach Mrs. Cronin had chartered to haul her guests to the Adirondacks and to her Roaring Twenties weekend party. I purposely got there early, but one of the guests was even earlier. Mr. Dollar, wait. Hmm? You are Mr. Dollar, aren't you? That's right, but I don't think... Prell, Jason Prell. I thought you might come down early to meet the bank messengers. Thank heaven you did. Well, I'm afraid I don't... Dollar, I have known Dolly McLean and Mrs. Cronin for over 35 years. All that time, I've managed her business affairs, arranged her personal contacts, been like a father to her. Yeah, I've read the newspaper clippings. Well, uh, newspaper stories can be misleading sometimes. They build things up. Sensationalism. It's true, of course, that Dolly and I had some quarrels. Who doesn't? In spite of everything, I was still her best friend. Go on. I know Dolly, nor better than anybody else in the world. I know how she's gone downhill since Barnaby died, especially in the last year or so. And I know this whole idea is the worst possible thing she could do. Have you tried talking to her along that line? She won't listen. She's dead set on it. I'm hoping you can help. How? Point out to her how dangerous it is to go off into that isolated place with a piece of jewelry as valuable as a circle of fire. It's worth a fortune. Somebody's bound to try to steal it. I still don't get what you're driving at, Mr. Prell. But I just told you. It's the risk that's involved. To whom? To Mrs. Cronin, of course. She knows about the risk. She's willing to take it. She doesn't know what she's doing. Hey, you said something on the phone about her sanity. Are you trying to imply that no, she's... No, 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 no. Not, not yet. But she's not well. She's burned herself up back in those early years, and she hasn't much left. The only thing that keeps her going is... has a crazy kind of belief. Belief? Dolly believes in people. So do I, Mr. Perot. Well, yes, yes, of course. But Dolly's whole thinking hinges on it. All the people she knew back in the heyday, the people she calls her friends, in her book, they can do no wrong. She lived in a dream world, still does, like a fairy princess. But it never really existed. Things weren't like that back in those days, Mr. Dollar. So I've heard. Most of the people she thought of as friends were only trying to use her. 
Barnaby and I would block them off, take care of things when things had to be done, and let her go on living happily in her never-never land. And now, that's the only land she has to live in. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Why, some of those friends would cut their mother's throat for a tenth of the value of the circle of fire. Those are the guests she'll have at their party. Well, I've already been told once that somebody will steal that necklace before the weekend is over. Do you want to add your prediction? I think somebody will try. And that's all that's needed to start that dream world of hers falling apart and to make her face things the way they are. May I ask you a question, Mr. Prell? Oh, yes, of course. This trust fund you're managing that her husband left for her, just how big is the setup? Barnaby Cronin was a wealthy man, Mr. Dollar, but he had his ups and downs like every business investor. The capital is adequate for her support, but not much more. Is the necklace a part of the trust capital? It's her own personal property. Otherwise, I could have prevented it from being taken from the bank. You have complete control of the trust, then? Yes. Barnaby knew that she had no understanding of business matters. I see. She's old, Mr. Dollar. Older than her years. And tired. All that keeps her alive is her belief in the past. Yeah, her dream world. Where everybody loves her and protects her. Where she's still a dancing darling. And if that dream world is destroyed, she'll be destroyed along with it. Now phone the bank, Mr. Dollar. Ask them not to bring that necklace here. I'm afraid they think I was crazy. Why? Because I've got it with me, Mr. Prell. I picked it up myself two hours ago. Then heaven help us all. The convention coach Mrs. Cronin had charted for the run to the Adirondacks was arranged with a long aisle of individual staterooms and a main lounge area at one end. It could accommodate 50 people. But when the train pulled out, there were only six of us in the coach. Six. Out of the hundreds of friends she'd had in the old days when she was in the big time and on top. And even out of the six, three of us were new acquaintances. People who hadn't known her back when. I was there, of course, because I'd been hired to be there to protect her fabulous necklace. And Sylvia Blake, still playing it tough and cynical, was probably hoping for a magazine article. Or hoping for something. But the third newcomer, there was the question mark. just too exciting for words. Don't you think it's too exciting for words? Well, I... Uh... I know who you are, of course. You're Mr. Johnny Dollar, and you're supposed to protect those fabulous jewels. And I'm Laura Dean, and I think we ought to call each other Laura and Johnny, because after all, it's a party, isn't it? Up till now, I was having doubts. You're, uh, obviously not one of Mrs. Cronin's friends from the old days. Oh, no, I just met her back there at the station. You what? Well, I talked to her on the phone, of course. She sent an invitation to my aunt, who was a very dear friend of hers. Only they hadn't seen each other for years, and she didn't know my aunt had passed on over a year ago. So I phoned her and told her, told Mrs. Cronin, I mean. And she said for me to come to the party, she'd like to meet me. And I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Yeah, well, uh... Johnny, do you think they'll really have champagne in bathtubs like they used to back in her time? If they do, it'll get awful wet out. There are only six of us to drink it. Oh, gosh, I don't see how you can call six people a party. Well, the thing is, we'll all be in there trying hard. <laughs> now you're joking me. I'll bet you're fun at a party. Oh, wait till you see the act I do with a lampshade. Who did you say your aunt was? I don't think I said who. When do they start serving the champagne, Johnny? When they see the whites of your eyes. Oh, that's cute. I like that. Thanks. Now, about your aunt. Oh, poor old soul. She'd have loved this, too. You ought to hear about some of the parties she and Mrs. Cronin used to go to. Yeah, I imagine. They well, used to go every place together back in those days. The newspapers called them the Siamese Twins. The Siamese... Siamese Twins. That was just an expression. Fritzy like... Morell. Is that what you're saying? That you're Fritzy Morell's niece? Sure. Did you know her, Johnny? No, I never met her. Oh, you'd have liked her. She was a lot of fun. Loved a party. Gosh, I thought there'd be no people in this. Be she kept party? babbling on, and I listened to her and I tried know. to figure her out. The chatter was smokescreen. Underneath it, she was cool, sharp, and shrewd. I didn't know what she was up to, nor why she was here. But I did know one thing. Fritzy Morell had died about a year ago, true enough. But she'd left no surviving family and no niece. Laura Dean was a liar. I hadn't seen Mrs. Cronin since we pulled out of the station. She'd greeted us, then gone right to her stateroom and stayed there. And when I saw Jason Prell come hurrying from that direction, I could read the look on his face even before he reached me. Mr. Dollar, please. Mrs. Cronin? Yes, go to her at once. What is it? What's wrong? She was suddenly taken ill, very ill. Hurry. Mrs. Cronin. Now. Oh. It was just nerves. 
I've had it before. My doctor in New York gave me some tablets to take whenever... Are these the tablets? This bottle here? Yes. You know what they are, Johnny? Uh, yeah, I know. All right. So he does say it's my heart. But he's wrong. It's just nerves. Yeah, sure. That's not why I sent for you, Johnny. You have the necklace. Yeah. Want to see it? No. I'll wait until it's time to wear it. Johnny, I've written something here. I'm going to sign it, and I want you to sign as a witness. Well, uh, all right. Unless you'd rather have Jason Pro. Mm, Jason would argue about it. There. Now you sign. There you are. Keep it for me. <laughs> Do you mind if I know what I've signed? Oh, of course not. Read it if you like. In the event of my death, I, Dolly Cronin, being of sound mind, bequeath the necklace known as the Circle of Fire to Sylvia Blake. Sylvia loves jewels. She'll appreciate it. Yeah, I imagine she will. And she's not to know about this, you understand, because, of course, it'll be years before she gets it. Oh, sure it will. Now, you'd better try to get some sleep. I'm going to. And thanks, Johnny. It was nothing something. I was heartbroken when they didn't show up at the station. All my old friends. But I've been lying here thinking, and I've finally figured it out. Oh? They all went on ahead. They'll be waiting at the house. They're trying to surprise me. Don't you think so, Johnny? I said, yes, I thought so. But I was lying because I didn't think so. But she was still a dancing darling, and she had that way about her. You wanted to protect her. I didn't go back to the lounge. I walked down the corridor to my stateroom. It was night by then, and the corridor was only dimly lit. My stateroom was dark. When I opened the door, I caught a bare flash of movement too late. Oh! came two minutes later, I was lying on my stateroom floor, blood seeping from a cut in my head. I felt in my inside pocket for the bulky leather case that had held the necklace. It was gone. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old love and an old hate. And violence breaks out at midnight. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. (laughs) 